Although you weren't alive then, last Friday was one of the most important days in your life. Last Friday was Constitution Day. <laughs> it's a big statement. And, yeah, it is a big statement. <laughs> um, but it was really important because the Constitution outlines the national government. It also says um, fundamental rights, I mean fundamental laws, mm -hmm. and basic rights to all of its citizens. So if there wasn't a Constitution, then yeah, I guess we wouldn't be who we are today, and we wouldn't have the same rights that we have as American citizens. So although you weren't alive whenever it was signed, however many years ago, still it many, affects you. Many years ago, two, over 200 and some years ago. It's actually one of the oldest constitutions on planet Earth. Is it really? It is one of the oldest constitutions. We are a very young country as a country, but our constitution is very old because most countries, they pass new constitutions like every 50 years or so. Really? So that ours is held for 200 and what, 20 some years now is, that's pretty amazing, pretty impressive. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe like yeah. we need a little refresh now and again. But, uh, but yeah, it's super old relative to other countries' constitutions. And it still governs the stuff we do today, like um, the elections or still our freedoms, like the freedom of speech. I know that's a big thing going around right now. And other stuff. Why? Yeah, so there's an election going on. You've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed. <laughs> You, I, I assume you've been paying very close attention to, like, the local state representative race. Is that the one that kind you're pretty of. focused on right now? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to get a wide grasp of everything, you know, I'm trying to get my feet in politics, because I might yeah. do something with politics one day, okay. government, I don't know that is, that is good. We need, we need really strong leaders for everyone else here in the building. The Constitution only works. The only reason that we've managed to hold it together for 200-some years as a country, is that people like Trace and a bunch of you guys are willing to get involved and make it keep working. The Constitution is this, this great old document, but what really has held for 200 years, with one major exception, remember we had a civil war. Oh, yeah. like it wasn't, it's not perfectly clean, our history, but we've held a community of people together for 200 some years, and that that takes everyone like getting in, getting involved, yeah, doing crazy like things, building new schools, interpreting the law. Oh, interpreting the law. <laughs> okay, I didn't know where you're going. With but that. yeah, schools because you know you get the the passageway to education. So yeah, I guess. Yep. And if we need something to change our constitution, well, not change, but if we need to add something, then we amend it. Do right? it. Yeah. You can do the amendments. We have 20, 27 right now. Uh, we started with ten, so you can see that we've added quite a few over the years. The parts that are really hard to change, though, are like the articles. So there's these two parts of the Constitution. Everyone remember this? Uh, if you've had U.S. history, surely you picked up on this. Uh, the first part of the Constitution is the articles. Article 1, Article 2. So, for instance, Article 2 is all about the executive branch. So you guys see the election happening right now for president, you know, everyone. That one is impossible to miss. Uh, they're running for the office that is created by Article 2 of the Constitution, and also, Article 2 of the Constitution will limit all of their activities, right? So there's, if you're on one side or the other of this equation, uh, you're probably worried about the other candidate, right? That's how they're going on this year. But uh, Article 2 of the Constitution holds presidents within a pretty tight box so that no one president can sort of become a dictator or become a tyrant yeah. of some kind. So... Uh, you know, however you feel about the presidential race, it is what it is, you can be thankful that Article 2 of the Constitution is going to assure that our democracy will survive whatever happens in the election yeah. this year. And we have checks and balances, so no one branch can get too high. Yep. That's Article 1 and Article 3. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's not a history lesson, but it is, I think, good for people to know that the Constitution is living down there super deep below all of our daily interactions, but it is what is holding our community together fundamentally. Yeah, and a lot of it's people don't cool. even, even realize how powerful it is, and a lot of people haven't even read it, or parts of it, so. It's not very long. I mean, it's like, I'm probably know. gonna read it after this, so. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> you could probably get that whole thing read in about 10 minutes. It's Are you being serious? Yeah, maybe 15, it's not very long. It's really short. you read it in law school? Uh, well, read it from front to back, maybe less than 10 in my life, 
But how many times have I dealt with the Constitution? Very, very many. Yes, a lot. Yeah. Well, a whole it's lot. still extremely important. So that still holds hey, true. You want to know one interesting fact? Yeah, it's an interesting fact. There is something that relates to everyone's lives here in the building that the Constitution does not talk about. What do you think it is? I have no idea. Schooling. Nowhere in the entire U.S. Constitution is the word education or school, anything mentioned. So, uh, actually, when it comes to the operation of schools, the Kentucky Constitution is the, is the overriding document. They made a choice back, way back in the day when they, were, when they were writing the initial Constitution, they made a choice not to talk about schools. It came up at the Constitutional Convention. Someone said, hey, should we talk about education? And they all collectively said, no, let's leave that to the states. Oh, so every state has different schooling, so... We have like 50 different countries when it comes to public education. So like Miss Reno, calling out Miss Reno, <laughs> certified here in uh, Kentucky. I think she might also maybe be certified in like New Hampshire, Vermont, I think she spent some time. Oh, yeah. But not certified in Michigan, not certified in Oregon. So that's what I'm, what I'm saying. There's like 50 different countries you're only really certified to teach in one of those countries. Do you think that works better or worse? Um, <laughs> whew, good question. I think that there are positives. One, one of the positives is uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. For all the ladies in the room, you should know her name. Uh, she was the first female Supreme Court justice. One of the things she was really an advocate for was that the 50 states were like 50 different laboratories of democracy. So each of the 50 states would try something slightly different, and then we would see which of those things worked the best, and then everyone else would do that thing. And I think there's some real truth to that concept of laboratories of democracy, but for our teachers in the building, uh, if they wanted to move to a new state, it becomes a huge pain for them. For instance, Ms. Field moved from Ohio here to Kentucky last year and had to deal with all of the transitional paperwork between by basically teaching in a new country. So it's a lot of the a lot of pain in the butt trying to deal with all the bureaucracy to get that little bit of laboratory concept. Then you have to do anything. Would well, you have to do anything if you want to practice law in other states? Cause oh, absolutely. It works the exact same way. Good call. So I uh, was licensed to practice law in Illinois. I retired. That was awesome since I do all <laughs> this school work these days. Uh, but I'm not licensed to practice law in Kentucky, even though I passed in the state of Illinois, the state of New York, the state of California have some of the hardest bar exams in the country. So the Kentucky bar exam is actually easier than those. But, but even though I passed the Illinois bar exam, which is a harder exam, still no Kentucky license. So you can't do anything law related, basically. Uh, yeah, I'm not a functional attorney in Kentucky nor do I want to be because I don't I like being impartial on things that any anything where a lawsuit is going to happen uh, things have gotten heated and one party's position is is counter to another party's position in my role as a professor I really don't want to be on any sides I might, as a professor, choose to say, I think the best decision here is this side or the other, but I, I don't want to choose sides in any disputes because that's some messy stuff. And, yeah. and as yeah. a professor, it's easier and, and better and smarter for me to, to try to live a little bit above that. If you did want to, then how would you be able to practice law in Kentucky? Would you have to take the bar exam for Kentucky? Yeah, yeah, I would. Now, I mean, this is very deep in the weeds, but uh, you would... Uh, have to, uh, if you practice in a, in a state, if it, like if I practiced in Illinois for like five years, then Kentucky would assume that I'm pretty good at being a lawyer and they just give me the license. But I didn't practice in Illinois for five years before I started moving for this job. So I would, in Kentucky, have to take the exam again. So does this work for every job, like doctors or engineers or? Um, no, some, some yes and some no. Uh, yes to engineers, yes to accountants, Yes to architects, I think. For doctors, there is a little bit more of a national system at play. So, okay. But whatever field you choose, you've got to know what the rules are in your field. 
if you're thinking about working outside of Kentucky someday in your in your future. So, yeah. um, back to how weird you said stuff. Yeah, I'm every sorry. state is a like a little country. Yeah, didn't Thomas What's Jefferson Raptors too, by the way. Did he fight for um, uh, state rights? Mm-hmm. I like Thomas Jefferson. Well, keep in man. mind. Remember, that's how our country got started. The first version of the Constitution, you guys remember, the Articles of Confederation. Yeah, they were meant to be weak, I think. Yeah, they really did not want. It would be much more like Europe is today. When you think of Europe today, you really think of the separate countries. Even though there is a European Union, and they somewhat work together, that would have been, if the Articles of Confederation were still the, still the, the Constitution today, we would be like Europe, where... Kentucky would be its own functional country, and everyone would think about us as our own functional country that just happens to have an alliance with all the other countries around us. That's what Europe is like today. So, uh, yes, but so the Articles of Confederation didn't really work, but you still had people like Thomas Jefferson who were like, whoa, whoa, we don't want one big central government. We want to have 50 different governments but we want to work together on defense. We want to work together on uh, taxation. We want to work together on things like road building. Military. Yeah, right. So the states decided to form a deeper alliance under the U.S. Constitution. But the U.S. Constitution, that's why it's a limited document. Only the things in the Constitution can the federal government do. Only that. So, for instance, the federal, the U.S. Constitution doesn't talk about education. So, most of education is controlled by Frankfort, Kentucky, here, here in Kentucky, or it's controlled by Columbus in Ohio, for instance. The federal government's role in education is very small. Mostly, they just provide some grant money here and there, and they try to incentivize us to do things. Uh, but so, it's a limited constitution. The fifty states still have a bunch of powers, still at the state level. Uh, but one huge thing that happened was the Bill of Rights, those initial ten amendments. And if you read the Bill of Rights, it's only really eight. Because number nine talks about rights given to us by God, which no one really knows what those are. And number ten says that uh, everything that's not in the Constitution it goes back to the states. So that's not really a right yeah, per okay. se. So it's really, we say the Bill of Rights is those first ten, but really it's just the first eight. But some of the foundational thinking in those Bill of Rights, that's still today huge to us. How we think about freedom of speech, for instance, everything going on with the Kaepernick situation right now, we as a country have made a collective choice of this is how we're going to deal with freedom of speech. Those things really bind us together as a country. And, and 200 some years, it's held together. Yeah. Okay, so, so oh, last. what it, do like does every state's constitution have to go through the national government to see if it's like constitutional, like follows the rules of the constitution? Yes. Yes. So what if Kentucky said you don't have the freedom of speech, then that wouldn't work. Correct. Someone would file a lawsuit at the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court would say, "Hey, Kentucky, your constitution is out of compliance with the national constitution, and it's it doesn't work. You have to write a new." Yeah. And if Kentucky took it to the next level, remember that's what happened in the Civil War. South Carolina actually was sort of the troublemaker. Um, any South Carolinians out there um, who they really pushed the envelope and said, no, you cannot tell us what to do. And they said, well, finally, look, we're so tired of you telling us what to do. We are going to get out of this whole situation. Now, what were they really mostly concerned about? Slavery, right? Mm -hmm. But that's when... You hear a lot of states' rights, Southern, since we're in the South, we should sort of know what's happening there. Uh, it was very driven by the right of an individual state to make its own rules around slavery or for freedom of expression or whatever else. And ultimately, the federal government in Washington, D.C. said, no, we have some foundational rules here, and you're going to follow them. And if we have to send in the military, we will. So do you think that after everything that's happened, it just ended up well, that the states have control and the national government has control? And there's obviously still kinks and stuff, but... I think it's a pretty good balance because Kentucky is not like Florida. So uh, 
uh, it gives us a little bit of ability to be different than another state or let's make it even bigger. Kentucky's not like California, right? We, California wants to live their lives slightly differently than Kentucky wants to live their lives. Okay, there's some flexibility in the system to do that. Um, so I think it's a pretty good balance that still gives some local thinking, but keeps everyone together from a national standpoint. I think it works well for a really big country. If you're not, though, a really big country, if you're a medium or small size country, then nah. Yeah. No. Like, for instance, Canada. Canada has provinces, and those provinces have some powers, but much weaker powers. Much more of Canada is much more driven by a central government than here in the United States, for instance. But has Canada had any major issues with our government? No. So well, Quebec, so. Quebec wants to secede about once every generation. <laughs> Quebec decides that it wants to split off. Um, and then they have some vote, and most of the people that live in Quebec are like, no, we would like to stay. <laughs> yeah. So that happens about once a generation. Um, but for the most part, it works for them, but they are a much smaller country. Even though geographically they're very big, from a population standpoint, they're much smaller. So, so I guess it's to each, you know, like... Each yeah, like, exactly. I think that ours places. is not the absolute best way to run a country it works okay for us, mm -hmm. right? A parliamentary system like Canada or like England or even like many countries, in fact, I think the parliamentary system is the most popular system rather than our sort of representative system. Um, so I don't know if that's better or not, but a lot of countries choose that parliamentary system instead of choosing sort of our system. In the parliamentary yeah. system, do citizens have any say in what happens at all? Yeah, you still have representatives. Um, but you don't have a president in the same way. You have a prime minister that emerges. From, it would be for it would be like for us letting Congress run the country in addition to passing the laws. So right now, Congress is only the only real job is to pass laws. The president runs the country. Uh, Congress, their job is is quite limited. Whereas in Canada, the Congress also runs the country. So they elect a prime minister whose job it is inside the Congress, okay? So this is not the country voting on a president. This is you vote on your congressperson, and then the Congress gets together, and they select who will be the prime minister. Then the prime minister is sort of the public face of the government, but all that government has to happen in the legislature much more. So there's a little bit fewer checks and balances than we have, but they might say to us that, yeah, but we can actually get stuff done. Whereas here in the United States, like, it's obvious, it's very, all those checks and balances make it very difficult to get a lot of work done quickly. Yeah, that's true. It's rare to have, there's a few times in our history where we, we took big steps. Uh, in the 1940s under the Franklin Roosevelt, this building, for instance, was built at a time when, uh, when the country was doing big things, all aligned under a Democratic banner. The 1960s, a lot of things really happened after the Kennedy assassination during the Lyndon Johnson years. There was really a lot of movement that happened. But for the most part, the United States is sort of a pretty slow-moving country. Yeah. And to you guys as kiddos, you know, I'm sure you feel that. I'm sure you feel that it yeah. takes us a long time to make a decision on something like homosexual rights which has been a big thing for us in the last 10, 15 years, those things really play out over a long period of time because we have so many checks and balances. We have a Congress that just is quite ineffective. So uh, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, well, it, but it's our system, right? Yeah. So we, we got to try to love it. <laughs> so do you think that if a student wanted to improve it somehow, do you think a STEAM student could eventually get there? And oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. Remember, all the way circling back to the beginning, this only works if, if you guys contribute. And yes, it's going to be hard to pass some new constitutional amendment. That is probably pretty unlikely. But it's not really hard at all to make the system work better at the local level, right? So... Look at what we've done here at STEAM. We are the government. This is the state of Kentucky functioning here. 
I work for UK, which is also a public school, so I'm, I'm also a state employee. So for me to, and for our team here at the building to really work hard and try to make things better, you can see that, yeah, we, we're capable of doing some big changing kinds of stuff, like internships and all the other stuff we do around here. Yeah. So that's, I think, the thing that everyone both can and should be trying to do as citizens is to make life better in their local community. And then once in a while, you'll have such a good idea that you want to take it statewide or you want to take it nationally. And that happens. Thanks, my man. Thank you, Dr. I pushed you, pushed you hard on this one. <laughs> Thanks for listening, all. Hope you learned a little about the Constitution. Appreciate it. Have fun this week in school.